can't. Okay. Okay. So um, before we get started, I just kind of want to get a gauge on who all is in the room. So can you raise your hand if you feel like you work at a really large enterprise right now in a large company? Everybody almost. Okay. What about if you're in the startup kind of smaller space, small agency? Just a couple guys. Okay. Cool. That way I know what to talk about. So, okay. Um, I just want to set a little bit of expectation here because a lot of you are working for large companies. This talk is not about how you're going to stick it to the man and like go around the red tape in the process and cause commotion. So if you thought that was what I was going to talk about, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. Yeah, the door is like right back there. Um, no, but so honestly today is more about um, I'm hoping to inspire people to take that ownership back and be an entrepreneur within their company um, and take a little bit more ownership of what you're doing um, more so than what you're doing today on your day to day um, and just really drive some change in your company. Um, so a little bit about me. Speaking of driving, I feel like I've always driven things into existence. I've always been kind of that leader voice when it's not there. You know, sometimes you just need to step up and um, help create a good atmosphere for people that aren't really as sure, being that voice for someone that isn't um, an extrovert or something like that. So whether it's, you know, a team that I played on in sports or those awful, like, high school group projects, we all were on them. Um, I think I've always been a driver. And then um, I graduated from Ohio State. Funny enough, I um, graduated with eight or nine internships, all not related in IT. I started out with content marketing, social media. Um, I drove all the creative for infographics and animated videos. Uh, did a lot of the content marketing side of things. Um, found out that I really had a passion for doing something that was constantly changing. And I was very fortunate at a company to, um, they asked me to move over to IT. So I was like, yeah, we'll try it out. And I ended up loving it. I ended up being a project manager at a small agency, doing a lot of everything. Um, and then now I work here at Cardinal for the past couple years as a product owner consultant. So I work at big companies such as the ones that you guys are working at and I help um, try to maximize the most value out of what you're delivering. So whether that's actually understanding the product or maximizing it out of the people that I'm working with. Um, me personally, I love to go to concerts. Um, this is just a shot from like 10 when I went to Bonnaroo for the first time. I think I was like a junior in high school. Um, and then I love to travel as well. So that's me as a real person. I was told to like humanize myself. So that's what that was. <laughs> um, so I think everyone, when they saw the title of this talk, they were like, entrepreneur, what is that, right? So everyone kind of understands what the definition of an entrepreneur is, right? It's someone who gets after it, they are responsible for the risk and the people and creating an organization and creating a business for people. Um, so who here thinks they know what the definition is for an entrepreneur? Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, it's an employee of the corporation. Um, they're really thought of kind of having permission to kind of go out of the lines a little bit and own something and go out of that process a little bit more and create something new. So in my mind, both of those examples, you're all hustling, right? An entrepreneur, you're a hustler. So I'm going to really quickly go into a little bit of a story time session here and talk about an example of a hustler who's an entrepreneur. So there is an engineer who um, he was asked a specific task. So I think we can all relate to this. You're given a project. You know exactly what is the expectation. And then you're told to just go do it. So in this example, he was told, you know, I need you to create a sticky adhesive that will withstand outer space. Go see what you can create. Um, 
it didn't stand the test of time. It was kind of thrown away. Um, and they were just like, let's move on to the next thing. You failed. Go on to the next project. But this guy was a hustler, and he believed in his failed product, and he brought it to life in a new form. Um, so can anyone guess what product I'm talking about? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is it? Gorilla glue? No. No? Let's do one more. Huh? Are you guys cheating? Yeah, it's post-it notes. Good job. Yeah, so 3M is a huge company, right? And just like, you know, a Huntington and Nationwide. AEP, you're told exactly what to work on. And um, so this guy was like, you know, just because I missed the mark doesn't mean that what I didn't create is valuable. Um, so yeah, post-it notes. Good job, Tammy. You are going to get a BB Bop. <laughs> Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about your working ecosystem, right? So there's a lot of layers in what you do and like where you work. The first one is about yourself, right? So you have the most control over you. So when you start in a, in a company, you're told what your role is and kind of here are the roles and responsibilities of what it is that you need to do. So. I'm going to try to challenge you to think about, OK, in that box, I'm told to do this, but how can I do more? So one of my favorite stories that my dad told me when I was a kid is about um, a bamboo man. Uh, so in a really remote village, there is a group of men. Every morning, they go out and they hack bamboo. And you know, it's a pretty grueling process. I actually did it like a couple months ago when I was in Thailand. Like, it sucks, right? So these guys do it every single day with a little hatchet. And when they're done in the morning, they take their like stacks of bamboo and they go to the nearest town and they try to sell this bamboo. Majority of them, um, they take, they pay someone to get in a vehicle and they drive down to the next town to sell the bamboo. There's one guy who did it a little bit differently. So he would take his bamboo every day and he would create a little raft out of it and then he would float down the river on this raft to the floating market. So he did this for a couple of reasons and I think it really relates to how you can do more with um, your role. So he's invested in his craft, right? He really took a lot of time to understand what are the best pieces of bamboo, um, how can I create this raft, how can I actually not die floating down the river, right? So he's invested in the things that he's doing. And um, so I challenge you guys to be more invested in what you're doing and grow your craft, whatever it might be. Um, another reason why he did this is he wants to stand out, right? So we all work for a company. I have the same title as multiple people, but how can I stand out out of those people? Um, figure out a way that kind of shows that you're a little bit different than the people that share the same role as you. And then the final one is stepping outside of the lines a little bit. Um, so everyone, you know, was taking about half of their profit to jump in this truck to go travel to the next town. And he stepped out of the lines and said, I want to do something different. Um, so just think about whatever the language is that you're learning. If you're a developer or, you know, any of those tools we were talking about in the weekend workshops, thinking about how can you use something that maybe your company isn't doing today and stepping out of the lines to show that you're invested in your craft and that you know, you're trying to do more. Um, so the next part of like your ecosystem that you work in is your team, right? Um, so who has heard of the term squad goals? Everybody, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so the best way I feel like to be an entrepreneur is um, not focusing on yourself, obviously, but you're identifying that there's great people around you. Um, so squad goals is this aspirational term to say, hey, I'm kind of jealous of that group of high performing team, right? You're jealous of kind of what they have. It's, they're a squad of people and your goal is to be more like them. Um, so how can you create squad goals within your company? The first one is about inclusion. So right now, I am a product owner. And I think by definition, everyone thinks that that means I'm the final decision maker. I'm the sole decision maker. I have the best ideas. 
Um, but the reality is decision making doesn't mean that you have the best ideas. You need to be inclusive and include everyone and let every voice be heard. Another thing about it is by involving people, they feel more empowered in what they're doing. So if you're involving more people from your team and you're letting them have a voice, for me personally in my role, um, that allows a lot of the cut down of me having to clarify on things because they feel empowered to make their own day-to-day -day decisions. And you should do the same as well. Um, just even if it's someone that um, might not be in the same discipline as you, so if you're a designer, um, but you're including some of the developers, because I know that's a common you know, battle of thinking, oh, you designed something that I can't develop for, and vice versa. Um, but if you guys talk about it and include each other, then you can have a little bit more of that empowerment with each other. And then also thinking about outside of your team, right? So if, especially if you work in a large enterprise. So everyone's focusing on your immediate team, but there's other outsiders that might not be a cross-impacted <coughs> system, but it's more about marketing, risk, legal. Um, those people have just as much stake and can help you, and including them can help not make a big mistake down the road. So there is a project that I worked on where we were texting a lot of PII information, so like personal identifiable information. So that can be a combination of your name and address and your birth date, right? So someone can hack you that way or your social security number. And me and my team, we were just driving, 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 and then risk kind of got word of it and they were like, wait, you can't do this. We have to stop the project. Um, but we were all really proud of what we had started. So I kind of took it upon myself to say, uh, let's not stop this project. So I took everyone in half day sessions for three straight days and we whiteboarded out some solutions on here are the things we're not willing to compromise on, here's what we want to ideate on. And then because of that, our whole entire team was able to continue on um, with what we wanted to do. So the next piece of creating squad goals is being supportive. Um, and I can't say this one enough, especially for the non-IT, IT folks out there like myself. Um, there's an issue with over-promising, right? Over-promising and over-committing to work that the team isn't comfortable doing. So confide with your team, try to understand what the commitment is. Um, let them speak to that, let them be the SMEs um, and support them in what they're doing. And then there's this common battle about technical background. So this can be applied in my world, you know, they always argue how technical can a product owner really be. And I would argue the same thing for if you're a developer, right? And you're saying, uh, I don't understand what UX does. They just make some pretty pictures. That's not really supporting what their background is. Um, take an interest in what they're doing because I guarantee it can create this empathy between the two of you. Um, and the next one is just about kudos and encouragement. So if you see someone doing something great, let them know. Um, and then taking an, an invested interest in everyone's process and what they're doing from their department. So for me, um, there is a group of people that I worked with and they had a problem of getting all the demand in, right? Because they had an enterprise-wide solution and so many requests were coming through and no one was funneling in. They were constantly stressed, just pounding, pounding away at trying to get things done. And I took a step back and I asked them, you know, have you thought of funneling it through one person, creating a checklist to identify the things you and after we kind of put that new process in place, they were a lot happier, right? It wasn't my job to manage that team, but it's something that you can do if you see that your teammates are struggling or hurting with something. And then finally, we all have stakeholders or bosses, right? So making sure that you're connected with them and letting them be your hero too and you being their hero. So. I guarantee there might be someone above you who's communicating what your product is and the work that you're doing, um, and it's a direct reflection of what they're capable of too. So check in with them and understand how you can support them in the things that they need. And then the final way you can kind of create squad goals is self-reflecting. 
Um, so this is a huge one about just checking your ego at the door. Um, it's really easy to kind of, as you develop your skills and you know you, you become more invested in your craft, just take a little bit of time to look inward and try to understand, you know, how much am I coming off a certain way? Because at the end of the day, you won't have true influence if you're, if you have a big ego, right? Everyone wants to work with someone great. Um, and then. Think about the entire group that you work with every single day. So I guarantee there's about five to ten individuals that you work with every day, right? So think about them one by one right now. Think about how skewed, how helpful are you versus being needy? Are you constantly asking for things from them? Like, can you help me with this? I need a quick tip, that kind of thing. Or are you being more helpful? A lot of people, it's kind of skewed, right? They're being a little bit more, I need, I need, I need. Um, if you kind of flip that and be more helpful with the people that you work with, squaggles, right? And then this one is just my personal pet peeve. Um, think about your role in the company and how desirable are you making your role? How attractive are you making yourself in terms of what you do? Um, if you're constantly complaining about how slammed you are, how stressed you are, how you don't have a moment uh, you know, of sleep, you're just constantly working, 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 you're not making what you do seem desirable, right? So take some time to self-reflect on how you're representing yourself um, because the goal is for people to be like, oh, I like, I think that Tony's job is cool. I want to do what she does. You know what I mean? Um, just take a little bit of time to understand exactly how you're representing yourself. Okay, so the next area is about your company. So knowing a little bit more about your surroundings and the things that you might take for granted as you first start um, at a company. So this is all about entrepreneurship. So how is entrepreneurship defined at this company? What are some things that are stepping a little bit out of the boundaries? Um, how much ownership do you really have? And how is it punished or rewarded? Um, so it's good to kind of get that historical baseline to understand like the foundation of like how decisions are made, how decisions are affected, if there's a steering committee, if it's there's a governance group, is it you have to go through different tiers. Try to understand first the foundation, foundational piece of how decisions are made and then how can you redefine what entrepreneurship is at your company. Um, so what are the things that you can take ownership or how can you affect real change? Another one is just being invested in what's happening in the company. So we all work at really large organizations. It's hard to feel like in the know of what's going on, but I guarantee if you show investment on caring about what everyone is doing, you'll be able to connect the dots and you'll have these connecting the dots moments. Um, whether it's someone is working on some technology or has a new vendor in place and it's something that you can leverage. It's important to be able to connect the dots and understand what is going on at all levels. I know it feels like you don't have time and you are constantly in your own silo and narrow, but try to expand a little bit more and really take charge and be that entrepreneur within this large organization. Okay, um, so the other thing is about knowing like your product in your company. So most of you sound like you're at a large corporation. So understand like the historical knowledge of the product, the metrics. Why did this architect architect it this way, right? I get that all the time it, at legacy systems. Like try to understand all the webs and there's probably some history around it, you know. Especially, you know, you acquire more companies and more companies, so the systems get more complicated. Show a little bit of empathy and like wanting to understand the product as it used to exist. If it's something new, if you're working at a startup, for example, try to understand how your product can affect, you know, change in the market that you're trying to be in. Just so just do your research, know your surroundings a little more. And then the last one is about hierarchy. So um, thinking about 
it's good to know where you fall on the tree, of course. Understand like how many people are making decisions, those things that I talked about, but I kind of challenge you to like throw that out. Definitely respect everyone's title and their roles, but don't feel pressured or scared to just go directly to the source. Um, I literally just experienced this this morning where it had, you know, very high up person saying, I want this. And I was like, did we actually talk to that person and understand if he really was passionate about this? And come to find out he wasn't. You know, it's just, it's little things like that where if, even if you're not comfortable talking directly to the source, find someone, find a buddy who can be your proxy to like let your message be known, um, let your concerns be known. It shows that you care and you're not just like falling on the wayside and letting things happen. Whether it's good or bad, it's good to hear feedback straight from the source. Um, so the next one is about your product. But before I get into that, I feel like controlling the you and your team and the company and trying to enhance those experiences are more, you can do that at any point in your career. Um, once you start caring more about the product and the vision, I think that is how you build up fully to being an entrepreneur. So the first three items are kind of what you should be focusing on on the day to day. And then um, once you get to caring about the product and creating the change, this is really where the magic happens. So for your product or whatever you're working on, be the champion and actually care about what you're doing. Um, and, or if you feel like you don't care, try to find something interesting about it that you will care about. Because at the end of the day, this is work that you're doing every day. And it will be better if it's something that you can feel passionate about. So for me as a product owner, my job is to talk about the product all day long, every day, you know, talk, making decisions, um, researching, doing a lot of things to understand what the product is. And you do this by storytelling. But I feel like a lot of people only focus on the things to the right of the screen. They focus on the timeline. So when are we releasing this? What is the date? You know, that's always like the number one question. So is it the summer? Is it Q4? What are we doing? Um, and then the second piece is what is the actual deliverable? What are we delivering? I feel like those two pieces only tell part of the story. If you're only focusing on the release date and what exactly are the requirements for what you're delivering, you're only telling half of the story. So a couple of things to kind of think about telling the full story is talking about the strategy. So strategy is this very weird term that sounds like a nice buzzword and everyone's like, ah, I don't really know how to define that. Um, but strategy can be thought of being that connecting tissue between what the vision is and then how you're gonna execute it. So it's like that connecting tissue between those two things. So I think focusing more on the strategy instead of the execution only is a better approach. So what it ties back to is the why. Why are you doing this? Why does it matter? Why is it affecting change? Um, and take an investment on knowing the why for your product, no matter if you're a developer, a designer, because it, it brings out the passion in you and what you're doing if you understand the strategy and why you're doing it. The second one is just really about ownership. So as an owner of the story, I'm very committed to you know, understanding this is, this is my baby, this is my product, and taking ownership of that. Um, so whatever you're doing, let it be known that you are kind of the SME on it, Take, because you've already taken the steps to be invested in your craft. You're understanding how it um, can be affected over time. And for me as a product owner, thinking about ownership is not just about um, affecting the delivery of what I'm implementing, but thinking about the after effects after it's implemented. So thinking about how can I communicate this change out to the organization? How do I um, create these talking points and touch points? That's me taking ownership of the entire life cycle of the product, not just the immediate Thing that you're delivering, thinking about how it will have longevity and continue to um, be something that someone is caring about. And then finally, being concise about the message. Um, 
this is a huge thing. There's a lot of ambiguity when you work at a large company. Someone thinks you're delivering X, another one thinks you're delivering Y. Um, take ownership on having a concise message. Um, that way it doesn't get a little bit confusing. And the way I do that is I create this thing called a walk around deck. So the idea is that I can walk around and put this deck to anyone's desk and they'll get a good understanding of what the product is. Um, so for you guys, if you're not a product owner, the way that you can still have a concise message is connect with someone that does know the vision, hear them for verbatim, like what the goal is, what the why is, and ask more questions, understand the why better and the strategy on what you're doing. Let that message be concise because there might be outsiders that are coming in to hear about it and that's when things get muddy, right? Like one person thinks that you're delivering this enhancement and it's just not true. So try to be more concise about the message and what you're delivering. So the walk around deck, these are kind of the things that I always include in a walk around deck. Um, first is an FAQ. So this kind of evolves over time, right? I show people a walk around deck and they're like, ah, I'm still a little bit confused on this. So this helps like customer service. Um, if you're a de developer and you haven't seen, you know, you don't understand the functionality of things, anything that kind of will help guide a little bit more of that story. Another part is talking points. So I think I touched on that a little bit. So trying to say this is exactly if someone calls in, um, how can I help mitigate some issue? Uh, something might go amiss. And it's more for like customer services too, or if you're selling something, right? So how do you want to sell this to the customer? Um, what are some of those talking points that you want to be echoed throughout the creation of what you're doing? And then of course the vision and the strategy. So why are you doing this? Um, why did you think this was a good idea? How, what is the business case towards it? And how can you create that return on investment over time? Um, another one is just like the use case. So actually going through all the user flows and understanding how each kind of flow can be implemented and how every user will touch this and what are the different like components and actions that a user might take. Uh, visuals, if they're available, right? So if there's a wireframe, a mock-up, a prototype, something like that, um, put that into the walk around deck as well so that way people get an understanding of what it is that you're delivering and they can see and feel it and it feels real. Um, and then include some of the boring stuff like the release date because people still do care about that. And um, definitely the business value again, which is similar to a business case, but more about what are the softer benefits that you're kind of thinking. Is it more customer retention? Is it just a better brand voice? It can be a lot of different things. Okay. So then the last piece of like your working ecosystem is the vision. So tying this all together and thinking about what is the why and thinking about um, how it's all tied together and what you believe is something that you want to work towards to drive towards. Um, so for me, I always talk about like what my true north is. And this should be what your vision is, um, whether it's about your role or the product that you're delivering. Um, so the first one out of my true north is remembering the why. So any kind of decision that I'm making, anything that I'm working on, I always revert back to remembering the why and understanding like why we're doing this. Um, another piece of my true north is remembering to be empathetic. So whether that's with myself, because I don't get it right every time, with my team, with the company, um, the product, just being a little bit more empathetic in the decisions that I'm making, as well as thinking about the end user and what their experience is. Um, the next piece is thinking about remembering the past and the future. So remembering where the product was versus where I see it going. Um, thinking about all the metrics, uh, the vision for the role too in your company. So thinking about what was the list of roles and responsibilities as you, an interactive designer, but how do you want to do more and create something more future for yourself? 
And then finally thinking about how to validate and continuously repeat this process, right? Thinking about the why and the empathy and who you are and repeating that cycle. Um, because everything, you sh you're not gonna get it right the, right the first time. I know that it might feel challenging working at an enterprise, but if you start to break things down in pieces, everyone has this expectation to do this project. But if you talk about it with your team to say, we want to validate this slice of it and see if it's valuable, um, and then continue to build on it. It's, it's showing that as an entrepreneur, you're invested on the entire life cycle and moving throughout the entire process. Um, so those are kind of the elements of my true north. So basically, this is your working ecosystem, yourself, your team, the company you work for, the product, um, even the vision, right? So if you tie all these things together and try to improve in all of those areas, you'll secretively be more of an entrepreneur, right? It's not this hard skill. It's more of a soft skill to kind of let your voice be spoken. Um, so thinking about all the takeaways from what I was just saying today is being more invested in who you are and what your role is. Um, go a little bit above and beyond. Be invested in your craft. Thinking through how can I include others and um, be supportive of them and understand what their day-to-day -day is. Um, and then thinking about self-reflecting. So these are all things about how to create squad goals. Um, knowing your surroundings a little bit more, understanding how your company is set up today and how you potentially want to change it in the future. Think about the work that you're doing. How do you build it up to being more about storytelling versus story selling? Um, get more into like the heart and the meat of why you're doing what you're doing. And then find your true north. Find something that is the vision either for the end goal of what you want as a, out of a product or the end goal out of what you want for your own personal career and role and constantly refer back to your true north as you make decisions day to day. Thanks. your questions. I try to fly because I knew it said 7.30 or 7.15. So we'll take a couple. What happened? <laughs> this is scary. You don't have to be on video if you don't want to. attributes you're looking for, yeah. how do you measure that objectively? The attributes for my team? Right, so for example, you talk about over-promising over or... Oh, yeah. Or Yeah, yeah. Um, so my role is a little unique. As an efficient product owner, you have to understand that you are not the SME in everything. So you can take that in any role. So if you're a developer, you're not a SME in UX. So I humbly say, I don't know how much this will, what this effort will look like, right? And even if you are the owner of your discipline, so let's say you are the lead developer on your team, there's still other elements that affect the end product, right? So objectively, there's things that I do, I can estimate for because I have the experience, right? Like I can probably tell you how much a really good website should be for like a mid-sized company based on the features, right? But if it's something that I'm uncomfortable with, you just have to kind of consult with other people and make sure that it's a collaborative moment. Yeah, there's some things that are just with experience that you can kind of, people will trust you to make that choice, but if it's something you're unsure about. I don't think Jeff wants to be on camera, Sean. <laughs> yeah. I'm earnestly interested in what, what your thought process would be around this. 
So when I lived in Dallas, I went to the Dallas Museum of Art like seven times to see the John Paul Gaultier show, just for the quote at the beginning of the entrance, yeah. where it says, the idea is more important than the means you use to deliver the product. Mm -hmm. And where I work right now, I'm an architect, and there's an idea that I think is really important right now that is gonna change our culture, but seven different people have had the same idea in different departments, and it centers around chatbots. And the technology is super cool. Yeah. And everybody's trying to solve the same problem the same way, and they're all entrepreneurs in my eyes. And what I'm trying to do is bring all these people together from different silos across big walls that don't get crossed usually. Yeah. And what are, what's your recommendation based on your uh, ecosystem? Yeah. What should I do to help break those walls down a little bit further? Yeah. So I kind of touched on it. So are you talking about to just break the walls down to ideate on something new, basically. I like, I'm an old lady and I can't hear that well. So are you, are you just asking how to break down silos and ideate on something new? I'm more interested in, so I've got an entrepreneur that I work with right now. Mm -hmm. That there's, like, there's two people on my team that are entrepreneurs and they've got a really great idea and they're ideating on it and delivering it, right? Yeah. But I've also, as an architect, I've got six other divisions gotcha. that are executing on this thing. And what I want to do is I want to take the best of those ideas oh. and bring them together and come up with one kick butt solution. Kick ass. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotcha, right? yeah. Um, so that's an interesting topic because I feel like I have experienced something like that. And it's challenging because you might have all these other ideas that or something that were already over promised or something that was already promised that you would do and some and then it needs to be mixed with something new um, but at the end of the day we're all just people right so I think it's kind of cliche to say but it's a for me I've always been more successful on bringing those people face to face and collaborating um, and I kind of touched on this earlier but everyone needs a chance to speak everyone's voice needs to be heard so um, what I do is I usually set up in the beginning of these sessions, I set up this wall that I call the fact sheet, right? And I say, everybody on a post-it, write things that you are not willing to part with that are like absolute must-haves. These are facts. These are things that aren't even objective. So it might be something like, this system works like X. That's not changing. So everybody writes down things that they know, the knowledge that they already know, things that they're not willing to budge on. And then whoever's facilitating walks through that, some conversation happens, and then from there that helps set up the foundation of things that aren't willing to budge, right? Those are the facts. And then from there, everyone talks about, we, I go through an exercise of walking through like a mind map or user flows, and we talk about here are all the potential ways that a customer could experience all these things at once, and we start to ideate on that process without solutioning yet, right? So you have the facts, then you have how people might interact with it, and then the final piece is like ideating, truly creating like something. So that, that is my process, is bringing people together, let's talk about the facts, let's talk about what this could potentially feel like, and then let's solution it. I don't know. Can you hear me? Not Hello. really. I have a fan. <laughs> Good way. I'll talk loud then. Just tell me if I'm like too loud in the mic. But anyway, so a lot of this stuff that you're bringing up, I feel like is, um, hmm, I don't know how to put this, but like in a lot of ways, it's like a very like flat structure. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something that is like very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of foreign maybe to some of the people uh, Oh, am I supposed to look over here? Hey, Sean, what's up? <laughs> um, so I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I feel like a lot of times like you have people who are in positions of authority who maybe don't feel that way. Yeah. Um, like a lot of old white dudes. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you like demonstrate like your, you know, kind of like your value? Like what yeah. is, what do you do when you come up against somebody who's like, okay, why should I be giving away all of this like kind of agency or authority to other people? 
Yeah. Because I'm on the same page with you. I, I truly believe that you have to like kind of spread it around. But right. what's been your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I feel like that was the things that I mentioned on how you can improve in all of those little areas. I wanted everyone to feel that there might be a couple of touch points of you being like, hey, that is me, to identify that you really are an entrepreneur. Like anyone can be that. It just, it just depends on like what kind of range of how much ownership you want. Um, but that's the thing is if, if you're more of a quiet, timid person and you don't feel like you want to step into that role, there's always someone willing to listen to you, right? That can be that ally for you, that proxy, someone that can help make sure that your voice is still being heard. So find a buddy at your work, right? If you, if you aren't like comfortable with being that full force entrepreneur, like let's get after it, you can still do something so that you feel like you have ownership of what you're doing every day. And this is not to offend anybody, but if you really are someone who is happy with just taking orders and just doing your job and leaving, that's fine too. There are people like that and um, I don't think that's what this group is about. But if you're like that, that's fine. But basically just find someone to help raise your voice and a lot of things don't need to be said to be noticed, right? Like if I talked to a guy last night who said that he spent 36 hours just coding stuff over the weekend for fun. And you know, those are the things that he brings back to his job and he's like, hey guys, like I was playing around with this all weekend, it was really cool. And he's not trying to boast and brag about it, but he's saying like he's invested in his craft. This is something that he's passionate about and he's trying to expose other people to. Did that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, so my question is uh, the elaboration of the term SME. Yeah. Can you explain? Yeah, so, oh, I'm sorry. So SME is a subject matter expert. So um, it can be very broad or it can be super niche, but it's kind of like addressing, hey, again, you're invested in your craft and you want to be that person that everyone comes to for this thing. Like earlier, Vogel was saying, Sean is your guy for sketch, and that's because he's invested in learning on it. He's the SME for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's him. Okay, Laura, um, so if you work in a corporation that does have a lot of red tape and process, mm -hmm. and you want to innovate, mm -hmm. which to me, entrepreneurship and innovation kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. How do you innovate an entrepreneur, an idea, when there is rigorous red tape and process that you, you know, legally have to abide by? Yeah. Um, how do you work around that without stepping on toes and, like, I don't know, how, no, like, how yeah. do you fit your idea to the process? Yeah, so um, I think it's kind of the opposite of what I just said for this okay. example, but yeah. um, show up, right? Like show how this could impact the company and if your developer create a proof of concept, have something that people can actually react to. So. I think a lot of times people are asking for permission, so that entails a meeting, a conversation. But if you don't have anything physical for people to react to, it's not really an idea. And you're not also investing time into showing why you think it's a good idea. So if it's something that you're very passionate about, do your research, show that you did it, whether that's like a deck, you know, for something, or if it's actual live prototype, if it's you know, a wireframe, whatever you're passionate about, show up to work and show people what it is and actually put it into the context of that company, right? So a lot of the times people are just saying, hey, I have this cool idea, let's talk about it, let's ideate on it, but like take it one step further and actually put the time and work into delivering something tangible for people to react to. Two. I think Sean's scaring people. He's this, not. Is, this is actually more kind of a thought on what you said. Um, you're number three. It's know your surroundings, know the company. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just, as you were asking your question, I was thinking, well, if there's all this red tape with legal. Why not go over to legal and try and work with them? 
there's other departments, try and work with them. People want to innovate. People want to help you out. People want to come up with new stuff and change the way things are done, disrupt as the buzzword goes. So um, I was just thinking, why not get outside of your silo and talk to people and see what kind of cool ideas they can help you come up with and help, help shape it, push it in whatever direction it needs to go to get out. Yeah. Papa Lardo. Hey, Laura. Hey. This is more of a comment as well. Sure. I just wanted to say that I thought it was cool that the way you structured the talk, it wasn't um, you and then your product. Yeah. Um, I like that like, you have to see your product first in the light of the team you're working with to build it, as well as yeah. the greater company that it, it exists in. So I thought that was a, a good flow. So it's not just like you're crazy about your product, ah. but, you're <laughs> yeah. but you're seeing it in the proper context. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, that was very purposeful in the sense that like you, your team, your company, that's how you're building out the foundation. The product is kind of like, if you're not working on a good team or you're not feeling good about each other, you're not going to deliver good work. So, are we out of time? Okay, one more question. So, I, I work at a really big company with a lot of people who have been there like... A million years. Yes. I know them. Um, forever. So, so what has been the, the best way that you have found to get stakeholders and people who are going to be using your product excited about change? Because yeah. know, they've been doing it for 20 years. Why should they change now? Yeah. So. Um, I was just telling someone this story the other day, but I worked at a really large company and... I wanted to make some enhancements to the billing process. So as you can imagine, billing is like the most legacy system in any company anywhere, right? It's like people have been working on it for 40 years and it's a tangled mess. Um, so what happened is, you know, it was some very basic things that everyday users want to do as it comes to like paying their bills. So for me, it wasn't like a hard sell, you know, like it was pretty easy to say like, hey, don't you pay for your AT&T bill? Like, and isn't it easier to do it like how they're doing it versus what you're making people do? Um, so that part was easy to show like why we should be doing this. But how I kind of got it over the fence is I didn't work in the billing department, right? But I sat down and I met with the billing IT team and I tried to understand why their legacy system was such crap. And I was like, whoa, I feel so bad for you. And then the next step out of that, um, by empathizing with them and understanding their day-to-day -day life, I was able to go to the director over billing and I said, and I sounded a little bit more secure and like what I already knew about them, right? So I was like, hey, you have this problem and people don't appreciate paying their bills in this manner. Can we make some enhancements? And I presented an entire, you know, documentation right up on the business case. And I did some research to um, understand, like, the cost impact. I'll be honest, I, I did the research on the cost impact of putting on this new vendor to help with this problem. And that, that wasn't my role, right? I'm not in billing. I shouldn't care billing director how you do your things but by helping her push that over the fence and we got the contract signed and we got improvements at the end of it I was able to do my little billing enhancements right so it's just kind of about showing empathy and telling that story appropriately for the audience that you're presenting it to um, I know it sounds so simple but it is it's hard to kind of figure out the right appropriate words to get someone to feel what you're feeling and to make real change. I think that's it. Cool. One more hand for Laura.